Hello and thank you for watching this video. We have now passed the fall feasts of 2018 and, yes, we are still here. Over the past year, many who have watched for the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ, have been disappointed and others are even getting angry at those who continue to be expectant of His return. It is clear that the number of times we have faced disappointments and our inability to figure out a date on which we will meet our Redeemer in the air have offended many and have even turned some away from watching. It would seem that many would prefer to avoid disappointment or the ridicule they receive from their peers when watching for the return of the Lord than to remain watchful. If I look at the attitude in the comments of some of the videos I have posted recently, it would seem that those who get angry at people who watch for the return of the Lord far exceeds those who remain watchful and expectant and I find that really sad. My question to those who are angry is this, why are you angry? Why are you offended when your brothers and sisters are simply looking forward to being with the bridegroom and doing as he instructed us to do. Blessed are those servants, whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself, and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. Why are believers offended when fellow brothers and sisters in Christ are eager for the return of the bridegroom? Given the number of signs that our Heavenly Father has given us to know that His return is soon, should it not be the greatest desire of our hearts to be with Him while we continue to reach out to those who are lost and to those whose relationships with our Heavenly Father are not what they are supposed to be? So many believers will lash out with comments such as, No one knows the day or the hour, not taking into account that Jesus spoke those words before He was crucified, and before Revelation 1 verse 1 was written. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Do you really believe that Jesus, who is now positioned on the right hand of the Father, and who told John that the Father showed him things which must shortly happen, still has no idea about the timing of his return. Remember, Jesus is now glorified and no longer in a mortal body with which he limited himself. Yet they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. John tells us that one of the attributes of having the Holy Spirit abiding in us is being granted the ability to know all things. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Would there be anything that would not be known to Jesus at this point in time? Even if we, who are still subject to the limitations of this dimensions and the mortal bodies that we find ourselves in, do not see this manifested in perfection yet, Jesus certainly has the fullness of the Holy Spirit at this point in time, and would therefore also know all things, even the date on which He will return for us, as He clearly states in Revelation 1. I believe it comes down to the attitude of a person's heart. If someone's heart is in the world, then their desire would be towards the world, and not towards that which Jesus went to prepare for us. For them, the things of the kingdom of God would seem to be foolishness, and they respond in a manner in which this is evidenced. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. For those whose hearts are with their Redeemer and who want nothing to do with this world, the ridicule and scoffing are simply part of what we are told in the Word of God would happen to those who live during the end times. Our Heavenly Father knew that there would be people who would desire to know the time of our meeting with the Bridegroom and that they would try to figure it out. He also knew that we would be hasty in our interpretations 
and that this would result in disappointments, but this would also prove the hearts of those who remain watchful and steadfast, given that they continue to do so even when they are seen as fools for doing so. Are you suffering the scorn of others, even from fellow believers who are supposed to be brothers and sisters in Christ, who are ridiculing you for being foolish in the eyes of others? If this has happened to you, you may just be where you should be, because this is what the Word of God says would happen to those who are spirit-filled, and who discern with the Spirit and not the flesh. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For those who are calling your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, who are watching for the soon return of the Lord, fools, you may want to consider the following passage from God's word regarding those who do so. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother Reka shall be in danger of the counsel, but whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Why is this so important to consider, and why is the punishment for those who call others fools so severe? In my opinion, and from what I understand from the models that our Heavenly Father has provided us in His Word, there are some believers who will be removed from the earth right when the tribulation starts, and there will be other believers who will enter the tribulation, who were found unprepared when the bridegroom arrives. This understanding is based on the harvest model that is explained to us in the Old Testament, and which consists of three portions. Only the first two portions are allowed to be harvested by the owner, or in the case of the first resurrection, God. Those believers who enter the tribulation are given over to the poor, or Satan, and those that follow him, and are considered the corners of the harvest, and these are the ones who are in danger of hellfire, as they will have to choose between being beheaded for their faith in Jesus, or to lose their salvation by accepting the mark of the beast in their bodies. The book of Revelation clearly states that those who are resurrected after the tribulation have all, without exception, refused the mark of the beast, and were all beheaded for their choice to reject the mark. This clearly implies that if a person who obtained salvation by believing that Jesus is the Son of God, who accepts the mark of the beast in their body, that they will no longer be eligible for salvation. If you disagree with this understanding, please compare the following two passages in support of this understanding. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Does the Word of God provide any support for an understanding that would allow a saved person 
to accept the mark of the beast and to remain saved by doing so during the tribulation. I would think that the mention of any man and whosoever mentioned in the first passage would not allow for any exceptions. The second passage also confirms the fact that all those who are found on thrones and ruling with Jesus and who were beheaded during the tribulation all refused the mark of the beast. This clearly excludes the possibility that a person with the mark of the beast in their body would receive a position of honor in the millennial reign of Christ. It is then those believers who call their brothers and sisters in Christ fools who are in danger of hellfire. If we tie these passages together through what we read in the evaluation of the good and evil servants. This is what the word of God says about our heavenly father's servants that he considers evil. And given that they are called servants, they are believers who have obtained salvation by believing that Jesus is the son of God. And they also know that he is returning. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink, and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. So when you evaluate your attitude towards the return of the Lord, are you expecting Him early? Or do you believe He will only come at a later point? Or do you want Him to only come back at a later point, so that you can continue with what you are busy with in the world? When you interact with people who are discussing the return of the Lord, are you out to ridicule those who are expecting Him early? Or are you watching with them for the return of the Lord? Think about this carefully as the word of God has a lot to say about a person's attitude in this respect and by your attitude you declare where your treasure lies. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. For those who are still steadfastly watching for Jesus' return to remove us from this world, which is about to be judged and to be destroyed, what encouragement can I give you? We have now passed all the important feast days of 2018, and it looks like 2019 is on its way. However, I believe that even though it may seem that nothing will happen in 2018, our Heavenly Father has given us many signs to point us to His soon return. The fact that we know that we are positioned in the 120th Jubilee by looking back into history and biblical chronology, we know that something major has yet to happen that involves Israel. One aspect that I consider a major pivot point that is yet to occur would be Israel's response to the Middle East peace deal, otherwise known as President Trump's deal of the century. Why is this such an important event to keep an eye on? It is very important because it has to do with God's real estate. God promised Abram that the land of Canaan will belong to Isaac and his seed, and this promise was made by God alone, independent of what Abram, who slept at the time, agreed to. God is therefore solely responsible for keeping this promise to the seed of Isaac. When our Heavenly Father established this promise to Abram, He called it the everlasting covenant. If the nation of Israel agrees to a deal in which they give away God's property to those who have no claim to it, they will break God's everlasting covenant on His behalf. And then we will have a situation in which 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3 
could be fulfilled, and where Jacob's trouble could start. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. The word of God also tells us about the overflowing scourge that will come over the world because of the everlasting covenant that will be broken. Could this be the great destruction referred to in 1 Thessalonians 5? The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. Instead of looking towards God for obtaining peace, Israel believes that by making a deal with those who want Israel's destruction, they will obtain their desire. God calls this Israel's covenant with death, and this is also pointed out in the word of God. Because ye have said, We have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement, when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. On September 26, 2018, President Trump was asked when he was going to reveal his plan and responded with two to four months from that date. We also know that France has put pressure on the US to make the plan known by threatening to reveal a plan of their own if the US does not do so in the first few weeks following the midterm elections. This is still quite a while before the end of 2018. Should the plan presented to Israel require them to hand over God's land to Israel's enemies, and should Israel agree to this deal in exchange for peace, then they will basically force God to intervene in order to keep his promise to Abraham. This is when the rapture and the destruction occurs from which the Antichrist will be revealed, who will step in as Israel's savior to be accepted by Israel even though two-thirds of the nation will perish during the three and a half years that will follow. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Savior yet, what are you waiting for? God's word tells us that He loved us so much that He gave His only begotten Son to die in our place so that our relationship with our Heavenly Father could be restored. It is a free gift of eternal glory in the presence of God as one of His children which is offered to every person who would accept. Why would any person refuse such a loving gift? The world will soon face a time of evil that has never existed before on the earth, where Satan and his angels will be confined to the earth and will be allowed to do as they please. Our Heavenly Father did not intend for those who have accepted his gift of salvation, which is a completed work, offered to every person who would accept to suffer any harm under God's wrath or that of Satan. If you are saved and you believe that those who have been fully redeemed by God have to somehow prove themselves worthy by adding to what Jesus completed for us on the cross, then you are saying that what Jesus did on the cross was not complete and neither was it enough. Call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ today and give your life to Him. Believe that He is the Son of God that took away the sins of the world and confess it with your mouth. It is such a small sacrifice for receiving an eternal inheritance as a child of God, almost like just putting your hand out to accept a gift from someone. Would you not accept Jesus as your Savior today? He loves you and wants to welcome you into His presence and to give you a robe of His righteousness with which you can stand before Him, knowing that only His work on the cross can ever afford you that privilege. For those who have already become part of God's family, keep looking up and watch for the return of our Savior. The Bible tells us that there is a crown waiting for those who love His appearing, and that our Heavenly Father is searching out servants who will long for His return, 
and who will be standing ready and expectant when he returns. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Blessed are those servants, whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself, and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. Watch for Israel's reaction to Trump's peace deal. For me this is the last piece of the puzzle that is still missing, and which could very well result in the rapture of those believers whose desire is to be with the Lord, and the start of the tribulation. For those who want to criticize, scoff and condemn those who are watching for the soon return of our Lord, think carefully about what you are doing, based on the passages mentioned earlier in this video, and ask yourself whether your actions are bearing the fruits of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. Only comments that line up with what is mentioned in this passage will be allowed on this video. Until next time, or until we meet our Savior together in the air, God bless.